Today on The Final Bar, we're going to break down the further sell-off in the equity space. What levels should we pay attention to? Where are we at relative to the key points? We're going to break that down. Also here from my guest, Axel Kabar. Axel's from Tech Charts, based in Bulgaria. So we'll get a European perspective on what's been happening uh, with uh, the charts he's looking at. Also do a deep dive into the technology sector. Technology has been leadership. What does that picture look like now in terms of group and individual uh, stocks within the, uh, in the sector? Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Welcome to the show today. Uh, if you were like me, I was actually watching the tape in some small way cheering for the close to come to stop this downward trend that we saw going dramatically into the close in the last hour. We've talked a lot on this show about how that last 30 to 60 minutes tells you a lot about the institutional movement and where people are trying to fill large orders and certainly over the last couple of days has felt uh, you know much more negative than positive. I think we felt that in a big way today with the with the market almost going you know vertically down uh, into the close, pushing the S&P down almost five percent on the uh, on the session. You know, when we get to these sorts of environments, we, and, and again, we've talked for a while about how something like this would happen at some point. We're sort of in the middle of it now. It, it helps to take a proper long-term perspective, not just looking at long-term charts, but looking at your market history and seeing how this relates to other pullbacks. And we're going to try in our short time together today to try to uh, look at some of those examples. Let's talk about what's coming in uh, on Stock Charts TV and on the final bar, and then we're going to get to a market recap here. So next Monday, on our next episode of Behind the Charts, we'll feature a conversation with Fred Meisner. Fred's the founder of the Fred Report based in Atlanta. I had a great conversation with him. Uh, after that, on this show, on the third, we have Scott Smith from Briefing.com, and then Jeff Weiss, who's one of my mentors, a uh, longtime technical analyst, fantastic at the long-term charts. It's going to be a perfect time to bring him on. The week after that, we're actually going to have some guest hosts on the show. We have Tom Boley, Aaron Swenlin. Uh, we also have Julius DeKempner coming up. These are familiar names and faces to many of you. The reason why we have the guest hosts is because the final bar is going to be going on the road. We're going to be heading to New York for the Traders Expo. We're going to be appearing there. If you do make it to the Traders Expo, um, you can sign up using the link that you see on the screen. But also, please make a point of coming to my session. Say hello when you're there. It'd be great to meet you in person and to answer some of your questions. Uh, but it should be a really good event. We're going to be capturing a lot of fantastic content, sort of like our conversation with uh, Fred Meisner. We'll be doing that a lot of times with some of the speakers from the event. So should be getting some good stuff for you and uh, enjoy some guest hosts while we're gone. So, folks, like, let's get into a market recap. So, uh, by any definition, if there's any question as to whether this was a short-term pullback or something much deeper, if you haven't answered that question mentally by now, I, I hope today's session has sort of convinced you to really think about the risk side of the question, the potential for capital loss, and how you try to minimize the, uh, the potential for that. So, here's the S&P over the last two days. You can see the gap down today. Earlier in the day, just after lunch, it felt not too bad. Uh, felt like we were sort of recovering a little bit, sort of the stepwise motion. We did our YouTube live Q&A this afternoon. Uh, we do that every Thursday afternoon, 1.30 p.m. on YouTube. Uh, answered a number of viewer questions, and it was right about here, right in the middle, right at the peak of the day. As we're answering questions, things felt like this might be uh, okay, but, but boy, things certainly rolling over. And again, that last hour, I think, tells you a lot about where the big volume is going. And you can see that we really piled in on the negative side of the equation. This pushed the S&P down almost uh, 4.5%, puts it below 3,000 for the first time in quite a while. We're going to look at the daily chart in a minute here to sort of see what the damage was. Uh, mid caps, small caps all down as well, but it really came out of the large cap space, especially in technology and real estate, which are the two uh, lowest sectors. This downtrend going into the close has pushed the VIX almost up to the 40 levels. So we're up around 38 uh, as of the close, which is a big jump up. That's 10 points in the VIX just in the last, uh, in the last trading session. 
You know, bonds and more defensive things have held up a little better, as you can guess. Two things that, I, that, that come to mind that have held up very nicely. Bonds, so the TLT up over 1%. This has pushed the 10-year yield down uh, below around 1.3%. Uh, the dollar also weaker. Um, commodities pretty much down across the board. Gold actually finished up just a little bit in the green. It, it, it started up much, much higher, but saw dramatic selling into the close like everything else. But in commodities, oil has really been the weakest part of that. That pushed the DBC and other broader commodity indexes really to new, uh, to new dramatic lows. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500. We're going to come back and talk about some of the other themes that we, uh, that we saw today here. But refreshing the chart, I backed this up a little bit. And it's funny, I put this... This percentage move, this was taking the peak from just a couple of weeks ago, week and a half ago, down to where we were midday around S&P 3000. That was an 11 uh, percent drop. We've now gone even further down to 29.78 or so is about where we about where we closed. We've now blown right through that 61.8 percent level. And we opened around there, traded down. But then midday <clears throat> felt like we'd found support around the 200 day and gone higher. Now we've sort of completed a follow through to the downside. So the question is, is always now, you know, what's next? And again, as we talked about yesterday, you always want to look at where we're at, look at what I'd call the final bar, look to the left and see where we're at relative to where we've been. It's been very tough to get a read on a lot of markets because they've kept going to new highs. You don't have a frame of reference when we're at new highs. But now that we're sort of in this range, things get a little bit easier because we get a sense of where things are at relative to where they've been and what's selling off more deeply than other things. It can tell you a lot about the characteristics of the market. This push off that we've had has pushed the S&P down about 12% off of the highs from just a week, week and a half ago. This has made the RSI almost extremely oversold, which is a very different situation than we've had before. A little later, we're going to look at some of the other pullbacks, other sell-offs in market history in recent years, and how this one is certainly way more, uh, way, way quicker and way more severe than a lot of those other ones. It certainly felt like that with so much of the sell-off so quickly, uh, but we're going to look at some of the charts and see visually how they relate to one another. So what does that mean for where we're at right now? So again, looking left on the chart, we're sort of uh, below that most recent support. We have that confluence support around 30, 50 to 30, 70. This comes from the 200-day, the Fibonacci support, and also the low from early December. We've now gone through that. So by my read, the next major item I'd be looking at, the next major line in the sand would be the lows from August and October. We sort of had this, what I'd call a demand area, an area at which buyers came in. This was the rally uh, mid-summer last year. We sold off going into August, September. A number of times saw buying coming in around this 28.25 to 28.50 level. That's sort of the next thing I would be keying in on, which would really 100% retrace the rally from October to uh, February. It's often been been said that, you know, stocks uh, go up the elevator or go up the escalator, go down the elevator. And that's certainly what has happened. Things sort of gradually go up. But when people want to sell, they don't gradually sell when they start panicking. They sell in volume and they sell very quickly. And that's what's happening right now. We're going down very, very suddenly. So again, I'd be looking at those levels as some sign of stability, expecting the market to at least take a breather if we, if we, if we keep going off uh, into, uh, into tomorrow and beyond. Let's look back at some of the other reads to see what happened uh, at a high level here. So on a sector basis, healthcare was the best sector, followed by industrials, but both down pretty dramatically. So 3.4 to 3.7 percent for both of those. So everything down pretty big today. Um, on the downside, you had real estate leading the way lower, followed by technology, followed by energy. Energy has not been surprising. That's been down there a lot. Um, uh, and, and oil prices, commodity prices, certainly weaker. So that's no surprise. It's interesting to see tech coming down so quickly uh, and also real estate and utilities. I want to talk just a little bit. We're going to do a deep dive in technology uh, a little later. We'll talk about some of the reasons why technology would be at the bottom of the list, why, you know, and, and along with defensive stuff like real estate and utilities. It seems to be a bit of a head scratcher, but I, I think there's some good reasons why that, uh, why that tends to happen. In terms of what's up, very, very little to, to, to speak of. In terms of things that were down the least, China A shares, the KBA, also other China-related ETFs were just down slightly relative to the major sell-off in the U.S. We'll see, you know, going into tomorrow, I would assume that Asian markets get hit pretty hard based on the sell-off we had. That tends to be how things uh, play out. They'll follow suit with uh, what, what happened to the U.S. I did want to switch gears a little bit and just point out that 
when this happens, when the market goes down so dramatically, remember there are stocks that are up and it's easy to feel like everything's down. It's very easy. All you need to do, look at the market movers, look at the S&P 500, look at what stocks are up the most. You will find things that are actually jumped okay. And again, they might not be the most gorgeous charts you've ever seen. Uh, they might be in it coming from a position of weakness. But my point is there are stocks that are up on a down day. You just have to know where to look. You have to look for the things uh, that have moved okay. And things that are stabilizing, things that are sort of finding some sort of, uh, uh, you know, some sort of holding pattern uh, can be uh, can be pretty uh, can be pretty compelling. I thought it was interesting just looking at some of the the highest rated scooter ranking uh, stocks or scooter ranked stocks. One of them was Netflix is one of the top uh, names, a scooter ranking of 98, so 98th percentile. And again, it's not a great chart, but it's not bad at all, right? It's actually holding up okay. We have sort of, it's actually called a gravestone doji, which is kind of an ominous way to talk about that. But that's what that pattern is just today. But overall, it's holding up okay. We're still above the most recent swing low, so not a horrible uh, end of the world uh, type, of, type of move. You know, other things to pay attention to, just themes to, uh, to think about. Some of these stocks within healthcare, like Pfizer and Merck, actually held up a lot better better than other things. So, uh, you know, Pfizer, the relative strength starting to turn up pretty good. It was still down almost 2%, but at a time when most things were down much, much worse, Pfizer's actually testing these all-time, uh, you know, these long-term lows here from last summer. So while it's not my favorite chart in the world, I like looking at things that are selling off a lot, uh, a lot less than uh, the, rest of, uh, the rest of the world. Um, uh, let's see. The other one I wanted to point out was uh, in, within Staples. There are actually some names that um, that have sold off. And I'm, what I'm concerned about is not just the names that are pulling back to support. It's also stocks that are breaking down through long-term support. I think this is, what, this is one of the challenges with the commodity, uh, the chart of the commodity index. I think it's also a challenge with something like uh, WBA, which is when within the Staples group, you have to, something going to uh, a pretty major new low, going uh, you know undercutting the low from last June and August. And so in more of a defensive part of the of the uh, of the market, you have stocks that are sort of uh, that are dropping off uh, very, very, very quickly. So we just touched a little bit on what's happened and where to look for opportunities. Again, I would encourage you to look at the member dashboard, look at the market movers and specifically look for things that have held up, things making new relative highs. We have some great screens to identify the stronger relative names or just look at the scooter rankings and look at some of the top rated stocks. That's where you could find some things that are holding up and might be a good uh, sort of uh, hiding place within any sort of further downside. We need to continue on today, though, and go on to our next segment called the Sector Deep Dive. What we like to do occasionally is take a step back, look at a particular sector, and start to think about what's, uh, what's happened, right? Think about some of the themes that have come out. And we thought it'd be interesting today to look at technology. So tech was one of the worst sectors just today, you know, big sell-off and tech down almost 5% five, uh, 5 or so. Um, so, you know, what does that mean? If you remember our show yesterday, if you tuned in, we had Julius DeKempner, and if you missed it, go to our YouTube channel, you can see yesterday's replay. But we looked at this uh, relative rotation graph, looking at the rotation of the 11 S&P sectors. We talked about how the XLK was sort of the outlier, as most things were sort of on the left half of the rotation graph showing you relative weakness, many things heading southwest like healthcare, like financials, like energy. You have something like the XLK, which has been uh, by far to the right, the leading, it's one of the few in the leading quadrant. It's far from the benchmark showing you it's been an outperformer. What's happened in the last couple of days, though, is this weekly RRG has now started to pivot very quickly. In general, you want to own things that are going northeast. You want to underweight or not own things that are going southwest. Tech just starting to uh, to turn a little bit, and that's why it's interesting to see, you know, what 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 sort of happens from here. So, how can we try to answer uh, that question? The next thing I would do is look at the sector uh, view. So, I tend to use this candle glance page, and I'm looking at the XLK chart over here, so it's interesting to see how many sectors have broken down through their 200 day just in the last day or two, and communication services, both the consumer sectors, uh, financials, materials, industrials, all have broken down through their 200 day, also real estate in the last session or two, right? So that's pretty, uh, pretty big swing. Healthcare testing its 200 day right now. Technology is one of the few that's actually still above. It's maybe the only one with utilities still above the 200 day. So what do we do when we're thinking about tech? So I would be looking from the low, uh, the, the market low from December 2019. This is looking at the last two years of history. We can see on the relative strength that tech has clearly been an outperformer, uh, you know, a, a nice consistent run of higher highs and higher lows and outperformance on the relative strength. Now that we've pulled back, where are we at relative to these key long-term levels? Doing a Fibonacci analysis based on the low from 
uh, the end of 2018 to the peak from a week ago, we can see we're not quite to that first 38.2% level. It's around 86 or so, uh, just below 86 on the, uh, um, on the XLK. That lines up actually from the low from early December. That was sort of that last uh, pullback before the nice run going into the new year. Tech was one of those things that actually performed really well going into the holidays and coming out of the holidays. A lot of things pivoted around uh, year end. This actually just remained in a position of strength. You'll notice the 200 day ascending and right about around that same level. So 84 to 85 is really a key confluence of support, a, a number of support levels all around the same place. So that's sort of the line in the sand I've been looking for with technology. Makes sense that we'd have a, a bottom there lining up with previous support, some of these levels. Expect at least a little bit of a bounce. And if that holds, that would be the question as to whether tech remains an interesting uh, place to, uh, to sit. The challenge that you have with technology is that, um, let me refresh the page here, um, is that, uh, you know, what happens when the market sells off? And let's say you're a money manager and you own uh, the big benchmark names that have been outperforming, things like Apple and Microsoft and, and other things as well, Facebook and other things. Let's say you start to uh, need to get defensive and you need to start unwinding those positions. Where do you get the money from? You have to sell some of your winners or some of your speculative positions and put them, some of your core positions, and put them into more defensive places. So if you want to buy utilities or something like that, higher yielding stocks, you have to sell some of your Apple or some of your Microsoft to be able to fund those purchases. And that might be what we're seeing with tech being so far down. This has been leadership. And if you want to take profits on some winners rotated to other parts of the market, that might be a, a place where you would start to raise cash, meaning you'd sell positions. That's going to provide some, uh, some downside. So if you look at the technology sector, this is within the industry summary page. You can look at the industries within tech. You can see consumer hard, sorry, computer hardware, the number one uh, group within there. That's Apple's group. Then you have software, 94th percentile. That is Microsoft's group. You have semiconductors at 87th percentile, and then on down through the rest of technology. So these top three groups have been really the strongest places to be. And we're going to look at a couple of these just very, very briefly to finish off this, uh, this deep dive into tech. If you're looking at something like the uh, semiconductors, there have been some names that have done very, very well. And, and out of all the charts we're going to talk about, something like NVIDIA may be an outlier as a fairly decent chart. It was down pretty big today, 5.5%. But if you look, it's just testing an upward sloping 50-day moving average. The RSI is still above 40. The relative strength is still pretty good. I mean, it's come down 15% in the last week, but we're still up 50% in the last six months. So it still had a nice uh, overall trajectory. We really haven't even put in a lower low yet. Um, so overall, a name like this might uh, be interesting. This relative strength line on something like NVIDIA and some of the other semiconductors would be really important um, to, uh, to pay attention to. So I'd encourage you to look at some of the other semiconductor names. Um, the other thing I would tell you is uh, just bringing up the chart of uh, NVIDIA. Uh, my colleague Gaddis Rose, who's one of the fellow contributors here, he has a chart style. I named it Gaddis. I think it's just called the Gaddis Rose chart style, but it does a really good job of illustrating a stock versus its group, the group versus the sector, sector versus the benchmark, all those different ways. Looking at a stock like NVIDIA, you can see how technology's gotten hit, but if you have to be in tech, something like NVIDIA has actually been one of the better semiconductor names, holding up okay on a relative basis and seeing if those relative strength lines can hold up might tell you whether or not you want or remain in a name like NVIDIA, or try to get more cautionary, get to, uh, to other places. That's all the, the time we have for a sector deep dive uh, for technology. I hope you can follow that process on your own. Look at the relative rotation graph, look at the industry summary, uh, and start to dig into some of the individual names that make up those groups. We're going to take a quick commercial break, be back with Axel Kibar. We'll see you in a minute.
Welcome back to our show. Thanks for joining us on The Final Bar every weekday. Keep your questions, your feedback coming to us. The Final Bar at StockCharts.com is the best way to get a hold of us. I want to bring on our guest, Axel Kibar. Axel comes to us from Bulgaria. Axel, we have had very few Bulgarian technical analysts on the show. I am super excited to have you on. Thanks for joining us so late. Thanks, Dave. It's my pleasure. So you uh, do such a great job on uh, on social media, sharing uh, some of the wisdom of the charts, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have you on and, and share a couple names. You sent us two charts that are, are compelling here. The first one was uh, a, a British stock, uh, Glencore. What can you tell us here? Yeah, so uh, here's what I'm doing. Uh, I'm uh, looking at um, uh, charts uh, with the classical charting principles approach. Um, so this is one of the uh, oldest um, technique and technical analysis. Um, so uh, this is one of the uh, widely known and followed classical chart pattern, the head and shoulder top. So the Glencore was a commodity play, uh, is a commodity play, and um, this chart formed a long-term, 29-month long head and shoulder top, uh, and the 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 chart pattern completed mid 2019 um, and at the time of the breakdown we've seen a slight pullback to the chart pattern boundary uh, the breakdown took place below the long-term average which is the uh, 200 day uh, 40 week average in this case um, and since then the stock has been in a clear downtrend and uh, recently, it formed another six-month-long descending triangle. And with this uh, equity market sell-off, this six-month-long descending triangle is also breaking down on the downside. So with head and shoulder tops, the uh, price uh, target calculation is basically taking the neckline, which is the horizontal boundary, uh, the distance between the head and the neckline, and uh, subtracting that from the uh, breakdown level, which is the neckline again, 272, which gives us 183 levels. Now, when we look at the six month long descending triangle, the price target calculation is taking the, uh, the depth of the chart pattern at the widest point and adding, uh, subtracting that from the uh, breakdown level, which is almost giving us the same price target. So we still have more downside um, uh, for this stock. Uh, for the head and shoulder top to reach its price target. Now, one thing that is uh, interesting here is um, when I'm looking at classical chart patterns, I'm looking at those that have clear horizontal boundaries. With head and shoulder tops, it can be an upward slanting neckline or a downward slanting neckline, but I prefer the ones that have horizontal uh, neckline. In this case, Glencore has this quality. Also, the head and shoulder top is a distribution pattern. And it's a distribution pattern, it's a reversal pattern. So if it's a reversal pattern, here is the, uh, the, the logic that I'm following. If it's a reversal pattern, the reversal should reverse a major trend, major uptrend. So in this case, the reversal is taking place around the head with the breakdown below the long-term average. So as you can see, the right shoulder is basically an attempt to push back above the 200 day average and it's a failure so the right shoulder is forming below or slightly above the um, the 200 day moving average and then it's establishing a clear downtrend below the long term average so i try to check those qualities with the head and shoulder top the next chart for example that we're going to be looking at is a recent breakdown and have the similar qualities that I'm looking at, uh, there has been a clear uptrend. This is Credit Corp. It's a financial stock this time, um, listed in the US. It's a Peru company. Um, the stock has been in a clear uptrend. The left shoulder has been formed in the first half of 2018, and then the head was formed in the first half of 2019. And then we broke down the 200-day moving average. We went and we tested the neckline, which formed the neckline at that point, around 200 levels. And then we formed the right shoulder. The right shoulder, as you can see, uh, didn't push above the 200-day moving average, similar to the Glencore. So we formed that nice consolidation, which also can be identified as a rectangle. 
those tight consolidations when they break down after several tests of the boundary usually result in a nice uh, trend period. So with this weekly candle, we are, uh, we are clearly breaking down this 200 level that has been intact for the past 20 months. So this is a very long-term uh, top formation. And even though we have the price target as 167, this stock can move much lower as it establishes a clear downtrend below the 200-day moving average. So again, this is a distribution pattern. As it is a distribution pattern, it's a bearish pattern, bearish reversal, and it has to form after a clear uptrend, which is the case. So when I tick those boxes, uh, I have higher conviction on the chart pattern that has been developing and completing. Now, for breakdown confirmations, I'm following um, Edwards and McGee's um, a 3% breakdown or breakout guideline. Uh, so a stock should close on a daily closing basis uh, with a 3% margin below the support or the resistance. So in this case, 200 is our support. So Credit Corp should close below 195 levels on a daily closing basis, which has already taken place and the trend is, uh, the breakdown has, has been confirmed. Also with the head and shoulder tops, um, a chart pattern negation level is uh, being identified. What is a chart pattern negation level? The level at which the head and shoulder top will not be called a head and shoulder top anymore if that level is exceeded on the upside. And that level is the highest level of the right shoulder which in this case is 220. Now, um, long-term investors can use this level as a stop loss, or they can use the stop loss slightly above the chart pattern boundary, which is 200 level. Axel, we have to move on. These were two fantastic charts, and I think our friends at the CMT uh, Association will be so proud of how you are executing our toolkit magnificently. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing two beautiful examples of chart distribution, my friend. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Have a good day. It was Axel Kabar articulating beautifully sort of that distribution pattern and, and a couple examples of where, uh, if you're looking for uh, examples of a head and shoulders distribution, two perfect, uh, two perfect charts to look at. We folks need to close off the show by going to the three and three. I am told by my producer, this is the three and one and a half and we're gonna get there folks. So ladies and gentlemen, first off, the S&P weekly market trend chart. This is the first chart in my mindful investor chart list. If you've not gotten that, Go to my page, The Mindful Investor on Stock Charts. You can sit, click, uh, go to my chart list at the top and, uh, and review it, save it to your own login. But uh, what this is showing you is the long-term trend in the S&P. Anytime we have a significant sell-off, you need to go back to deeper history. Don't just look at the last year or this is gonna feel way out of character, which it is for the last year. But if you look further back, you'll start to see some parallels and start to see some relative movements. Now, by any measure so far, this has been an incredibly uh, you know, destructive week. We're looking back to the beginning of uh, 2018, maybe for any other example that, or even you know the sell-off in, uh, in December of 2018. So this is pretty unusual. But remember the fact that overall the trend has still remained fairly positive. The weekly PPO or the weekly MACD at so far has registered a sell signal. We'd have to wait for Friday's close to lock that in for sure. But barring some dramatic improvement, that's gonna give us more of a tactical, cyclical sort of short-term sell signal for the S&P. Two other charts to put this week's sell-off into proper context are looking at a deeper history. This is the VIX going back to uh, 2000. A lot of times I've, I've heard people ask about the VIX and they say, well, this is the highest the VIX has been. It's not. If you look at the last year, you're right. It's pretty high. But if you look back to like 2008, the VIX can go way higher. So it's all about the relative movements, right? So now we are getting into a bit of uncharted territory for recent history, but we're still not near the extremes that we saw in 2010, in 2011, to say nothing of something like the major sell-off in 2008. So even though this feels destructive, which it has been, the market can go much worse and the volatility can increase much more than we've seen so far. Finally, I would also point out the new highs and new lows. We've talked about this before and how there hadn't been as many new lows. We've certainly seen an increase in new lows this week on the New York Stock Exchange at the bottom on the S&P 500. This hasn't updated for today, so this will be a lot lower. But I would also encourage you, if you just look at the last six months, 
It's going to look like this is uncharted territory, but if you look further back, right now we're at the same amount as we saw in August during this pullback. Also, May, during the pullback there when we tested the 200-day, we're nowhere near where we were going into the market low in December. So this number can increase dramatically and still put us within the normal range of some of those uh, regular pullbacks. So my hopeful comment for you looking at the three and three, Look at longer term history and start to look at some of those historical perspectives of other previous sell offs. That'll help you navigate where we're at. And ladies and gentlemen, that's our show. I want to thank our guest, Axel Kabar from Tech Charts, coming from Bulgaria late at night to share his insights on some distributive charts. I encourage you to send your feedback to us, the final bar at stockcharts.com. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a good night.